Okay, this presentation was inspired by a paper that I read, and I don't read that much, but I was very impressed by this paper. And I'm a little biased. It came out of New York, my hometown, from a small hospital there at Columbia University. Dr. Rosen Swag, and uh, they have an amazing experience. I mean, Journal Heart and Lung Transplantation was published in. It, uh, and it's a... Oh. oh, you need the controller? This, this, here, I'm sorry. Okay. You can use the controller. You have to make sure that you switch your slides. If you're gonna use this to read, and you switch slides here, you have to make sure you switch your slides up there. Yeah, I know, but I'm doing, working a different way. Okay, uh, yeah. so sorry. No problem. I only did what I was told. No, no I know, sir, I know. <laughs> so, um, you know, again, uh, so this is a combined paper between uh, Presbyterian and, uh, you know, uh, Tennessee. Vanderbilt, two small hospitals, I would say. You know, uh, Dr. Rosenzweig is amazing. I met her before, and it's an amazing experience, uh, you know. Now, it's a scary thing for me, and you guys feel jump, uh, to jump in any time. Patient with pulmonary hypertension, severe pulmonary hypertension, is a very scary patient for me. They never come to just a little sick. They come usually crashing and dying. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that a little. So this is something we need to focus on our work every day. And I, I like this quote. Apparently Socrates knows something, which we didn't know. That we need to focus our energy in doing something good, not fighting the past. That is a very important thing. And that's why I am a big proponent of telemedicine and tele-ICU and tele-ECMO, because we have to move to the future for better care for our patients. Pulmonary hypertension is a very, very, very bad disease. And unfortunately, there's no easy solutions for it. And any patients coming to you to, you to see pulmonary hypertension, they're in bad shape. Do you agree or no? Yes. And there are multiple reasons they're in bad shape and we go through that. Bad shape and they're desaturating and you're not sure how bad their heart is and you're not sure what to do. And not every hospital, not in Houston, any other place has nitric oxide and has ECMO and all of that. Do you have nitric oxide in your hospital? Uh, I don't. We have um, uh, Flolan, we use prostaglandins, but we don't have nitric oxide. See, our surgeons were to tell the Flolan as if you're cursing them. Yeah, I know. The, because of the plate of dysfunction, they can't stand Flolan, and it's nothing great. So we use Flolan, but it's not, we have nitric, we're have lucky we have nitric oxide, but I love nitric oxide. I feel nitric oxide should be in the air, should be misting around. <laughs> but you know the cost of nitric oxide, and unless you have a good contract, and it is what it is. Well, I don't mean to, to interrupt, but you know, since nitrous oxide, how, and I hope you'll touch on it, how does, you know, what would an infusion, a, maybe even a direct pulmonary artery infusion of sildenafil do in regards to, you know, having an alternative to nitric oxide? Nitric oxide would be much better, but. But the problem is those patients are on Viltari and other drugs coming from the hospital, and they're coming, they're crashing and burning because there's something tipped up over the edge. You need something that's gonna be more yeah, immediate. Exactly, and that's the problem. And you know, and, and you're right, that's what I said, it's not easy, you have to be intubated. You have to have the facility that has it. Not many facilities in Houston, or in the US has nitric oxide. Mm. I find that interesting, because it's not a hard thing to have. No. It's a very expensive thing to have, that's the problem. It's expensive, but it's, it's expensive not because it's difficult to produce. No, it's, no. I mean, your body produced nitric oxide, you know, but mm. what can I say? And so we, and the problem is that you have to look at, which is, I gave this lecture maybe a couple of months ago, about the exit strategy. I'm a big believer, and I'm sure you agree. Don't put anybody on ECMO unless you have an exit strategy. Yes. You know, and, but the problem is, and I'm, I'm not trying to be sexist or anything, most of the species pulmonary hypertension severe, they're females, they're young, sometimes they're having a baby, and you're not gonna hear say, well, let's see. I'm sure you had the situation. Let's ponder, should we put on ECMO or not? Let's see the situation. So you're really an extremist. Every time they come in, I feel like I'm pushed to the edge. You know what I'm saying? There's a problem. Uh, pulmonary uh, embolisms, I know there's something very bad and deadly. Chronic pulmonary hypertension is deadly. And now you're going to have to get the, uh, the room. Is the exit strategy going to transplant all these people? And they're going to do a lung or a heart lung. And it's a whole other world, you know what I'm saying? And I hate to say this. Most of these patients come into extremists because they're not compliant with their meds. And their non-compliance brings them into the hospital with failure and they come crashing. We call it the double doors crashing and burning. I've been in this uh, situation with perfusionists, Joe. Yes, uh, sir. Some of the perfusionists, you know, where we're there sitting in the water chatting, and the door comes, uh, the double doors open, and, and the patient's coming crashing and burning. And uh, they're rolling the patient to the OR, not even letting us know, 
because they know that this patient, any one more minute in the ER or that she's gonna die. Mm -hmm. They've seen it before. And once you intubate this patient, they don't get better right away because you don't know what their heart is like. The heart could be failing. So you have to think right away, what are you gonna do with them? So you put them on ECMO regular? I mean, so a strategy has to be in your mind. So uh, there's no medical treatment except unfortunately transplant or ECMO is just buying you some time. So uh, we're gonna talk a little controversy right now. So is it gonna, this is gonna be a bridge to a transplant or you're just uh, buying time? What, what are you gonna buy time with? How are you gonna buy time? So this is just a little paper I was talking about before I wanted to talk about it first. And now here's the concept of ECLS. I, I was not really with that concept 100% Then I talked to one of my friends, Dr. Ibrahim in Hamad and Qatar, and he, they have a very robust ECLS program. And I'll tell you something, I'm a big believer for ECLS. I wasn't before. I'll tell you, if, and I, this is gonna be a controversy that's gonna be a lot of people are gonna shoot me probably when I leave here. If you have a transplant program, or a VAT program, you have to have a very robust ECLS program. You cannot expect your code teams to take care of these situations. Your code teams, you know, gets called for other situations. So their code team gets called to manage medical situations. <coughs> but the nurses know if there's a VAT or a transplant that codes, they, they activate the ECLS program. And the ECLS program are in the hospital and available. That's a lot of cost for that. Because you have to have surgeons, perfusions, equipment ready. A cardiologist, pulmonologist, uh, to take care of that situation. So we're just gonna look a little at the paper and from it, we're gonna uh, come with some opinions. So here's our treatment goals. You know, uh, you know, this patient's name, what are we gonna do with them? Are we gonna just buy a bridge? Get some IV, uh, like Volturi, some nitric oxide, temporary situation, support their RV temporarily. I'm, I'm a little biased, and Joe is gonna beat me right now. I would, uh, I got the best bang for my buck. If we're gonna put this patient on ECMO, and they initially you're gonna go standard ECMO, but I support the RV, put an oxygenator, I go standard ECMO. And if you're having the French hypoxemia, which we'll talk about later, you can do double elimination strategy. Mm -hmm. Do you agree or no? Yes, I do. I mean, the How beginning goal. the double cannulation we, we'll strategy. Don't jump, ahead, think, of don't jump ahead of me. I'm not. But I don't think jump ahead of me. I'm trying not to. Okay. I'm trying to listen to you and them at the same time, but I'm picking up all that you're saying. Okay. Don't make me call Seal Team Six right now. <laughs> See, uh, okay. That was my line. <laughs> you're still in my line. So, I mean, see, the question is I mean, you're calling the ECLS a bridge, the bridge to nowhere or a bridge to something. Uh, what's your thoughts about that? Um, I think that the ECLS is very important. Um, when we um, started working on putting the um, heart transplant and the VAT program at uh, Scott & White, it's now called Baylor Scott & White, yes. but at that time it was not Baylor, it was just playing Scott & White. Um, uh, my mentor, Dr. Gongora, who is in Alabama these days, um, the first part was just to make sure that we have all the pieces together and we were able to do the transport. And the next step was to build the ECLS program. And having the, EC, the ECLS program in the house required, you know, to have a great amount of people well trained and ready to respond to the emergency. Uh -huh. I agree 100%. And I'll tell you, here's my little bias comes through. And that's where tele ICU helps you a lot. So if you just put a, uh, uh, you know, and let's say now in Memorial Hermes, you put an uh, ECMO in one of the small Memorial Hermes. I mean, that's, you have to call it Central Memorial Hermes, make sure there's a bed available that you can be able to fly the patient out to. That's how tele ICU can help coordinate all these hospitals together. Yeah, you're looking at an airport board, seeing your small hospitals and the main hospital, and seeing what, where is that, what's the availability, send something from the smaller hospital to the big hospital if needed. And that way, all these hospitals can do everything that they need to take care of these patients. Yes, and I believe that now with these big systems like we have in Houston, where we have plenty of uh, community hospitals and a big uh, mothership, as I call it. Yeah. Um, well, the small community hospitals have something that the mothership doesn't have, which is beds. 
And the Bingo. mothership has something that the smaller hospitals that, which is the technical expertise and, um, you know, maybe a little bit of technology that is not available in the community hospitals. And I have been working really hard to try to actually close the bridge and to build a relationship so we can have the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. in, in, and the whole philosophy, well, at least my philosophy, is that it doesn't matter which door the patient goes through, the patient is going to receive the best possible care. Agreed. That's an amazing concept. That is an amazing concept. Can I, would I be interrupting you if I added to this conversation? Please go I, ahead, I, sir. Because I don't want to, up, I don't want to disrupt your flow. No, no, I'm very good. We're an open you, flow. Well, with everything that you just said and with everything that you just said, us here on the panel from our perspective could not agree with both of you gentlemen anymore. Here's what the issue is. And I just went through this experience. I won't say where this occurred, but I think you and you and you know, we have a hospital that has the capability to have two different ICUs. Most of the hospitals that we have in the, in the, in the uh, community area has one ICU for everybody. In this case, there's two separate ICUs and they're on two different floors and wings of the facility. When we put an ECMO in with the model that we have, we have to be at the bedside 24 seven, or at least close, within close proximity to the bedside. Everybody walks around a little bit, goes to the cafeteria a little bit and then back. And we have that kind of relationship depending on the staff, the nursing staff that we're working with. Um, I know you're less, you're, you're more hesitant to do that than I am, but we do, with, depending on our comfort level and how many of these we do, how stable the patient is. In this case, they wanted to keep the two patients in these two separate units and not move one to the primary, what I would call the primary unit, which would have necessitated not just me having to tie up three staff every single day, it would have required me doubling that to six staff every single day for something that should only require three. Now, let's take that a step farther. As you were talking about ECLS, you were talking about ECLS and how important timing is to survival. When you hit the emergency department, and you want to put the patient on ECLS immediately, but you put the call out to everybody when you've made that decision, guess what you're going to be doing? Waiting. Why? Because your perfusion is busy. That's where the problem comes in. That's where training nurses, because there's so many more of them. This company, HET, that, 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 you know, basically is who funds all of this, but but the MediWeb, PerfWeb, what we're doing here is a separate company technically, but it's not, it doesn't make any money. Okay, that's this company makes no money. What we're trying to do is do something of value, but that's a separate point. Um, the fact of the matter is there's not enough perfusionists to cover all of the possible ECMOs and we can't, we, we're not always in any one hospital. You need to have, this company was, was built basically by training emergency room doctors how to initiate, set up and initiate ECMO, how to prime the ECMO circuit, built one that was, we called it doctor proof, no offense, I hope you won't take any, um, but easy, it's self primed, put the cannulas in, hook it up. The perfusionist is on their way to make whatever, maybe adjustments, fine tuned adjustments need to be made, but you can get the patient on ECMO right now without waiting for us. The fact is we need to train nurses. You want to have ECMOs in three different units in your hospital? Well, I don't care who you are, what company you are, how big you are. It doesn't make any difference. There are not enough of us. There's 4,000 perfusionists in all of the United States. There's 3.4 million nurses. It's a question of math. So that's my view. So my, my answer to you, and I agree with you 100%, and we've discussed that before, I think nurse ECMO specialists are very important. And I think going with that, uh, the same model, like intensives are not available all over the place. And that's why tele-ICU has become a big concept. I think there's a, there's a space for tele, tele ECMO. I mean, you need to be a, I mean, what, what can you affect the patient change image of your bedside? 
I mean, there's a, you can have a physician or a perfusionist monitoring a few patients and be in touch with the nurse. Yes. Bedside. Yes. And the nurse was specially trained to take care of ECMO patients. Yes. And the perfusion were able to manage flows, FI2, volume. Right. But, and if there's a surgical emergency, you still have to activate the surgical team. Correct. At the same time, from a surgical emergency to OR door is going to be, whether it's tele ECMO or on site ECMO is going to be, in my opinion, the same. Look, I, I, you know, and, and I don't mean, I agree with you 100%. Look, at the end of the day, if you have a catastrophic event occur, and unintended decannulation of the patient. The line gets yanked out. It doesn't matter if I'm standing there, if I'm standing there, and I'm a fairly experienced perfusionist. The patient's not gonna survive the event. If the oxygenator were to acutely thrombose and just completely clot off, and the patient is on VA ECMO and 100% dependent, or even 80% dependent on the VA ECMO, that patient is not going to survive. I mean, those are just realities. So there's, I don't, I really am unable, if you have a well-trained nursing staff who sees potential trends, and that can be done by monitoring and by recording and having people, you know, contact uh, when you start seeing a trend in the direction that you don't want things to be going, to come in and evaluate it. But when there's an acute problem that is, essentially 100% cessation of flow for whatever reason, it doesn't matter whether 10 perfusionists are standing at the bedside at that moment, the outcome has been predetermined. Well, uh, same, I'm gonna use the same concept of uh, the tele ICU, the doc says, patient's tamponadic, they take the patient to the OR. The same, uh, you know, you have to activate the OR, get everybody in. So I feel it's the same timing. I feel there's no time loss. You have the expertise to make the diagnosis. The most important thing is to make the diagnosis of the problem. And yes. then deal with it from there. Yes. Most problems happen because you're misdiagnosed or misinterpreting the data. That's, That's what all the, the, remember like people said swans were killing people. Swans are not killing people. Patients are people are killing people. Misinterpretations. Misinterpretations of data is what kills people. So if you have exper experts like you behind the screen, looking at the uh, flows and actually are going down. And then there's a problem when you activate the surgical team. So time to kill the patient, I think, is gonna be, that's the most important. Diagnosing the data, making a decision, and then going with it. Yeah, and I, 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 I have agree with you in a sense that I have said, perhaps we should have a special credential to actually read a swan. Because there is nothing more dangerous than somebody with a swan uh, whose doctor doesn't know what the numbers mean. That's scary. That that is a problem. And that's uh, a very prevalent scary. If you look okay. at <laughs> if you look at, at the trend when they say, "Okay, well, the swan is the evil thing," um, uh, well, that paper that was published uh, and everybody quotes about the swan. Well, they put the swan when there was nothing else that could have been done. Uh -huh. And like the pulse oximeter that doesn't save lives, like an arterial line that doesn't save lives, the SWAN is a monitoring device. Cerebral oximetry. And what it will save a life is what you do with the data that you are collecting. Of course. And the interventions that you are going to implement on that patient based on the data that you are receiving. Yes, agreed. I have to tell you, me, me and him are going to be a strong force right now. I like Good. that. I like, like, is it going to be two against one? Uh, no, no, we'll, we'll see. Well, if this you. is three against this one. one. Okay. <laughs> well, let's, let's put things in perspective. <laughs> OR, 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 internal medicine, pill pusher. Oh. <laughs> so, no, no, but, so I am the minority over no, but, uh, but uh, you you're, you're, talk about the swan is like, I tell you, swans don't kill people. People kill people. So it's about what I'm trying to say, misinterpretation of the data. If the perfusion is sitting that side or the nurse bedside side, it's not so what's happening. But they have an experienced perfusion that can monitor a few patients at the same time and from a command center who has a physician to back them up and a board certified physician who is certified in ECMO to back them up and it has a good relationship with the surgical team. Mm -hmm. uh, like saves you all. He would make the phone calls, doctor, I'm gonna have to choose my buddy's name. Dr. Bruckner, you need to get the fish to the OR right now. Yes. And then, uh, and that relationship is very important. Patient goes to the OR, whatever needs to be done, gets done. So I don't feel you, I mean, and I have to tell you, if I was you sitting bedside and not getting my coffee, I'd be, have to be restrained. Somebody's gonna have to restrain me. It's gonna be a big problem. So, I mean, for me, I mean, I do think our expertise, all of us have to be used judiciously. 
Yes, you know, so. but the problem is the expertise. And this is where what your concept and your concept are is, is where I think we're going to have to go is because there are, just because I train, let's say we start our, uh, uh, Sharon and uh, Becky and I, we get our ECMO specialist, nurse ECMO specialist program going and we teach all of these nurse ECMO specialists and they go out to their respective hospitals and they're monitoring the ECMO. The one thing you cannot teach is experience. Absolutely. When I get a phone call and they tell me this, this, and this, I can conceptualize it in my mind because I've probably seen it half a dozen times or more. And so I know what to ask for, I know what to expect. That's where I think people like Dr. Zubieta, Dr. Samir, Sharon, Becky, myself, are so important to have that expertise readily available in a telemedicine type of, uh, of, of, of program to where the nurse sees something, feels something, calls, you get to see into the room, see the patient, see the monitor, see everything that's happening, and you can give them guidance on what may or may not need to be done. And it could be that they're 100% correct, but they feel like they have that support. And I think that's extremely important. And what the real value of this is, is you bring a high level ex of experience to many more places. Absolutely. I mean, I, I cannot agree with you more, yeah. Of course, yeah. I would have no doubt. So uh, going back, I, and I'm sorry we diverged a little bit, but let's, I mean, I like this. I'm not going to say another word. No, no, yeah. I mean, this is a great discussion. That's what it's all about. It's different opinions, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, so now the question here, in patient codes, and the, you and I have to discuss this, is this a patient good candidate for ECLS? I mean, that's the big controversial way. Who is a good candidate, who's a bad candidate? Yes. We have, a, I have to say, I'm very lucky. We have a very robust ethics committee. And, but at that time, when the patient is crashing and burning, there's not time to, be, to do a journal club. Our head of heart failure taught me that. And not a good time to have a journal club, so you believe in putting them on ECMO, then see later what you want to do. Do you agree with that or no? Put them on ECMO, then figure out the situation later. Yes. Yeah. And then if it needs to be turned off, I mean, if there's a decision to, uh, to let the patient go, then I think we should be able to turn it off. I think the time, time, time is brain, time is heart. So pondering who I would, like, should we do it, should we not do it? No, just do it. And that's a controversial approach. But I'll tell you, I believe in that because get it all in early, you're saving as many organs as you can, and then you have the luxury of time later. The prize the situation, and then, you know, then the later ethics committee meets, get to talk with the family, when things cool down a little. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The problem is that many times, and I have no issue with what you're saying, I think what you're saying is 100% correct, Put the ECMO in, unless the patient comes in decapitated. Then I would not recommend it. But sometimes I've even is seen it, those. Is it I've there? seen those. Well, I've seen those put on ECMO too. Um, but you uh, you get it in, but there is no protocol for an exit strategy. It is all put on the burden of the patient's family, and I think that is fundamentally wrong. And I'll tell you, I recommend. I, I give credit to our heart failure team and lung transplant team. We have a very robust ethics program. Mm. Every patient, if they're electively gonna get a VAD, they're gonna see by ethics. And electively gonna get a transplant, they're gonna be seen by ethics. You need to have ethics and, and uh, you know, meet them with the family, uh, discuss goals of, you know, therapy, be realistic, be honest. Mm -hmm. You're gonna take a VAD, you're never able to jump in the pool. You're mm. gonna be able to have a very, I mean, guarded life. But that means you have to, somebody, Somebody, and I would not want to be in that very enviable position, but it requires that somebody or some group of people have to accept that they may say, we don't believe this patient is going to be a survivor and I have been fooled myself before. Not very often, but it has happened to me where I have said, I don't think grandmom's gonna be, I think she's gonna be cooked before the turkey because it was close to Thanksgiving at the time. And grandmom walked out of the hospital and I was shocked. So that's the an enviable position. Somebody has to be in because you know you're going to withdraw care and you just do not 100% know. Now we're pretty sure 
Sometimes, you know, like we're almost positive, but there's curveballs. And I think that's the ethical dilemma that we all have to suffer, you guys more than us, but suffer with internally. And I would not want to be in that position. I mean, that's why, I mean, I'll tell you, that's why you have to be very honest with the family, extremely honest. And we lack that sometimes. I've never had a family complain that we were too honest with them. Have you had that ever? No. Yeah. Family loves to be honesty. No, they get they get angry easier. because you're yeah. not transparent yeah. with them. Yeah. They yeah. get yeah. mad because yeah. they yeah. think be, you're hiding something from yeah. them. Yeah, be very honest. Tell them what's happening. Tell them where we're going, where you think we're going, based on results and tests. Mm. And you have to use your experience. I mean, we we have li- we have limitations, but we have to use our experience. And if you have organ breakdown and you have rising lactates. Yes. You know, yeah, things like that. All of us do have physiological indicators. We give them the best data we have and we're going to make a decision. Yep. And it's not just about surviving. I mean, for me, it's about uh, not waking up. It's about getting out of the house, having a meaningful life. Yes, of course. Meaningful life is a very important situation. Yes. That's far yeah, more yeah, important, important than just survival. I mean, you, right. you walk in there. You, let's go to the mall and ask people, do you want to be on a vent for the rest of your life or do you want to be able to walk around? We'll see what they say. You know, uh, well, no, that's not a good question. Do you want to be on a vent for the rest of your life or do you want to be dead? I mean, you have to sort of, you can't say or walk around. That's kind of a, a not, I mean, to be honest with on. you, to be honest with you, I disagree with you. If somebody tells me, uh, Hanny, you're going to be on a vent and I uh, that's for the rest of your life, what's your choice? I would say it's okay. It's, not, it's okay. My time is done. Yes. Let me go. I mean, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. You me know? too. Yeah. I feel the same way. And but we, I we joke that, about that a lot, but mm-hmm. I'll tell you, I have in my mind, and my advanced directive criteria that when we, if I get to it, I don't want to, I don't want anything else. Mm-hmm. And I tell that to my wife, she gets mad, but it's, it's reality from what we see is like there's certain, all of us have certain lines we don't want to cross. I mean, for, for me, the house is for the rest of my life. It's not quality that no, I want, you know I what I'm saying? That. And other I people agree. that's okay with. And so it goes to what your beliefs are and that ethics committee helps with that. And I think really you have a robust, when you have a group, an amazing group of ethics, People, they really help a lot, you know, and you let them talk to the patients and just be very honest. Your job as a clinician is to provide the best data you can provide. Let, let the family and ethics decide together. Mm-hmm. I think that's my own personal feeling. Mm-hmm. Yes, I agree with you. So I'll tell you with that said, my, my, some of my friends from Australia, and I'm not sure you know about this, Australia, they do not put preferred equipment. The, the ECMO team is like a zip the chest ECMO team. The, they want to put a body on ECMO, they will zip the chest open and center cannulation. So that is a, and this is Australia. We think like we're doing crazy thing. They are doing like crazier things than we are. <laughs> so I have to say, when I see that, my says, see, we're not that crazy. I thought I know we're not that crazy. So the, well, the physiological lifts are very important. If you have a dead liver or a dead kidney on ECMO, you know, you know that the outcome is not that good. I say, and I use a couple of numbers. If you have a, like a, a lactate above 20, a total belly above 20, on ECMO, there's gonna be a very big problem in the future. You know, these are two, two numbers that are solid indicators that's gonna be, a, outcome is not gonna be survivable. Mm-hmm. Uh, SCCM made it very easy. Two same numbers, 20, 20. The outcome is going to be very bad. So, now, ideal configuration of ECMO, I know me and Joe are going to fight hard at the end of the talk about that. Optimal timing is right away. Wait, go back. What is the optimal timing? Okay, good. That is right away. Should you intubate first? Should you put it in? Yeah. You know, that's the strategy they filed in this uh, paper. They intubate and put an ECMO right away. Mm. Okay, at the same time. Mm-hmm. You should not, there's nothing to wait for. Just go ahead and do it. You know, those pulmonary hypertension patients are bad. It's a bad disease. So. Here, uh, go ahead. So, so you see the goal is like early cannulation. You know, you don't want any end organ damage. I mean, when, you, when your liver is failing, kidney is failing, it's over. Your heart is cooked, it's over. And that's why you should you ponder. Now I'm gonna let Joe here weigh in. Uh, wh- wh- what's your favorite circuit in all these circuits for ECLS? For ECLS? Um, my for e- remember, for ECLS. Yes, for, for ECLS, yeah. I agree. In the emergency room you're talking about. Or oh, are you talking about, in the are you fl- talking in the emergency room or are you talking about on the street? On the floor. On the floor, uh, my own system, need none of these. 
I would I don't like I do not like any of these pre-packaged uh, systems. I but you have to remember the how the, the world's you're gonna have to go with a pre-packaged system that kind of okay. I mean, so you're telling me that my only choice is one of these three. At this guy, well, They're, because not any, everybody has Joe. We wish of, everybody has any Joe. Of them. I would, I, say, I would say cardio help. It's easy, compact, and like you buy a long. It has a long battery life. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, if that's what you want me to say, I'll say it. I mean, no, I'm not asking to say it. Say it. <laughs> I'm not forcing you. You know. No, you. I know. <laughs> well, but put that gun away. So what? Well, well, so you know the, the idea is have something easy to put to put in, compact, transfer, ready to transfer the patient out. Mm -hmm. Now well, we're gonna have can, ask can, I, can, I, can I ask two perfusionists? Who, Absolutely. Since we're the ones who have to run the thing, okay? You get to say, put this in, that's what I want, but we're the ones who actually have to do it. So of these systems, can, can just, with, and, or, or our own, which would you choose? Our own. I'm of gonna, these systems, which I'm gonna would interject, you choose? I'm gonna interject here for one second. We're putting the cannulas in, we're putting the right cannulas in, yeah. And, and you just choose, a, the system really does not matter to the physician. Does it matter to the physicians? The systems, no. What's important well, is you use what the perfusionist is comfortable with. Exactly. And of so, course. I mean, they all work, and, but it boils down to what is perfusion comfortable with. And the system that we use, it's not considered transport, but we've transported with it. Yeah, we transport with well. it all the time. So come down. And it's nah. small, and we can put it together. But from intra-hospital, well, transport, like, can you it's very simple. Yes. Can you elaborate on the system you're using? You have to tell everybody. They don't know what system you're using. So now I'm going to pick on you now. You're on the hot seat. Oh, Lord. See, you have to say that now, so <laughs> you can thank Joe. <laughs> we, we use the Soren system. Well, it's Levanova. It's, the, it's, okay. their, it's their iteration. They call it a trolley. Of course, they're not allowed to call it an ECMO. It's, they call it, it the, 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 the technical term they use is SPC, SCPC. Uh, but it's on a trolley. It's very movable. You've seen our system, Dr. Zubietta. You're familiar with it. And it just rolls around. It, you can roll it with the bed. Uh, you can adjust the line lengths very easily so that if you have a patient you want to put in the CT scanner, the whole ECMO doesn't have to go with them when you have one of these other little systems. And you can still manage the patient's support system outside of that field. But yet you can also have it right on the bed with them where you to take them via ambulance. Now, for air transport, no, you're gonna do air transport, you want one of these other systems. However, when you're doing air transport and you're sending your patient from a community to a tertiary care facility or a quaternary care facility, then they are gonna come get the patient with their own transport system. So you really don't need to have one. Actually, to be honest with you, I don't agree that every, all the equities that we've gotten, we've gotten them equity already. I'm sorry? All the ECMOs that we have gotten them, the ECMO system was there already. They were already. No, we have our, no, but they'll switch them. The helicopter will have their own ECMO system. And what they'll do is they'll come to the community hospital, convert the patient from your ECMO system to theirs. Because let's just hypothetically say I had one of these very expensive uh, systems. Well, I'm not about to send that system away to another hospital with the patient, I need that for another patient and they're extremely expensive and you don't want it to get lost. So the transport services have their own approved transport ECMO circuits like the cardio help or something like that. And small, compact, fits in the helicopter much more easily, a lot less weight. So there's things that make that system good. It's just that for the intra-hospital system, it's I think overpriced, much more complicated, and in many ways, in my view, less versatile in being able to do other things with the system. It has more limitations than a hybrid system, if you will. One thing I will tell you, I feel like a big system, like the biggest uh, giant system, they should agree on one system they're gonna use, like Methodist Memorial Herman, or something like that, one yeah. system they're gonna use, because once they put it in, it's going to the same Memorial Herman or Methodist. Well, it may be, but I can tell you right now, the community hospitals, the, the, you know, you have the hub, as you call the mothership, I think yeah. Dr. Zubieta you used, and then you have all of these satellite hospitals. Well, yes, they are all part of the same system, but they also all have their own budgets and they don't want to lose money in technology. So it's, it does work from a, from a, 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 a technical 
and and and, and uh, 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 whatever the word I'm trying to use, where you have these expertise that logistic, is shared logistic, easily, yeah. logistic, uh, expertise that's shared readily across that hub spoke design, but not necessarily all of the things that it takes the 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 widgets to run a robust program. Okay, one uh, one other question I ask about your system, Heparin. How much Heparin are you on? I mean, how much PDT? What's your PDT goal? It depends on whether it's VA or VV and at what point in the procedure we are in. So if it's a VV, I, I go with 1.5 uh, uh, times the baseline for the uh, APTT. So a uh, patient that has a, uh, uh, a PTT of, you know, 30 as their baseline. So then uh, we would do 1.5, that's a 45. Okay, we don't think you should adjust it to flow, not to... Uh... Yes, I do. I think if you have a low flow state, you need... Yeah. Sure, but that's where expertise comes in. If you're trying, for example, on VV ECMO, when you're trying to wean a VV ECMO, there is no reason to turn the flow down. If you're tr you just reduce the amount of, of, of ventilatory support you're giving them through the artificial lung. But if you're VA, you have to turn the flow down. That's the only way you can do it. And in those cases, I always remind people, and of course our, our team is skilled in this, to say, hey, we need to go temporarily up on the heparin because there'll be a longer transit time through this artificial surface and increased thrombogenicity because of that. I mean, I just want to remind people that you do not need to use 40,000 units of heparin. Some people do no, that. No, no, of course I not. I know, but I'm not talking about, yeah. not everybody's you guys, okay? Yeah. Remember, I mean, we'll do, we're talking you know, to the world. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. you have to assure appropriate anticoagulation Absolutely. at the same time. So 40,000 units of heparin is a single dose is a lot. We do heart surgery with it all the time. Exactly. It does have, you know, a, def a somewhat definitive half-life. Um, you can reverse some of it if you really had to, though I don't recommend it when you're on ECLS. However, and with that said, the risk of overheparinization as a single event is far less than the risk of underheparinization in that same circumstance. So give too little or give too much in that circumstance, I would say giving too much is the probably safer thing to do. Neither is great, but one is de definitely worse because once you clot your system off, the, it, once you develop thrombus in it, there's no getting it out. You have to now change that circuit so you've compounded your risk. For me, I have to tell you, 5,000 is great of, of heparin, and then you can run a drip if you want, you know. Uh, yeah, 10,000 would be my comfort zone. That's just a little weak. 5,000 is good, that's weak. <laughs> that's really weak. 5,000 is good. more than once enough. Again, once again, you're not the one that has to change the circuit. You only get to stand there and yell at everybody for taking too long but to we, change we, the circuit. We have to compensate for the mm -hmm. patients that hosing mm -hmm. blood out of their groins. It all just depends on where, that's right. But you can have stitches for, there's suture for that. And there's, there's, there's suture, avatine, there's all kinds of things. There's that stuff made from potatoes it is. that you can uh, that you that can was, pour yes, in there. Yes, the powder, yeah. Yeah, the powder, sure. Yeah. So I mean, I have to. I do agree with the forty to sixty. Um, mm. You know, and then there's people which might be a little crazy. Five hundred units an hour rate. Do you believe in that? A hundred units. Five hundred units. Five hundred. I mean, do I believe that that's the that's where the level should always be? No, 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 they, they, they put it. They're giving a bolus and then five hundred an hour straight. No titration. But every no, that doesn't make sense. Everyone reacts differently. Yes. You have to you have adjust to, it to right. your patient's needs. You have to measure the flow. lines, right. Well, the, that, well, the reason they use that is so nobody keeps it, like they have no clinical pharmacy that goes around. You have to start somewhere. Yeah. And so I would say you give a bolus, depending on how much of a bolus you give, um, would depend on whether you should start the drip or not. If you're only going to give 5,000, I would start the drip immediately. But where I think everybody makes a mistake is, they will titrate the drip depending on where the PTT ends up falling. Whereas I think that you get some steady state and then as you see small variations in your APTT, you give small boluses and see if that resets the baseline. Because a lot of times you turn it down, it's a while before you see, oop, went too far, then you're turning it back up and oops, we've gone too far. So I think small boluses with a set rate is an easier way to maintain a, a, a tighter margin within your APTT. And check out the 83 levels. Of course, if yes. yeah, if you can. 
But you, you should know. be able to. If yeah. you're doing egg wish, you're checking 83. Ah. Yeah, we'll put the notification up that the, that it's on there. We can check it later. They can go ahead and, and log into Slido. Oh, you need me to? Oh, so sorry. He told me to shoot. Okay, go ahead. It's not my fault now. We'll it's skip the break. Not my fault. We're going to skip the break. Don't worry. Anyway, this is the study. They looked at different patients and their scores. And I mean, since we are a little behind, we're just going to go a little more. Now, this is the different groups. And every one of those diseases that wheel is a nasty disease. Sarcoids, you know, but isolated pH. Patient with, uh, you know, uh, thrombibulous polymyositis. Every connective tissue with disorder, with pulmonary hypertension, is a huge problem. Do you agree? Yes. Those diseases have bad hearts, bad lungs. Every sarcoid, I believe, has a very bad heart. I'm very scared of sarcoid patients putting them to sleep, the bradycardias and the arrhythmias and all that. Yes. And so, every one of these connective tissue disorders is a big, big deal. Scleroderma, another very bad disease. To get access, now scleroderma access, can be very, very difficult. The surgeons have to dig really hard. Skin is very tough. Biggest part of scleroderma is the skin is very thick. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you, these are experience, and I do worry about when they start digging and then dilating and all that. They have to dilate more than usual, and then bleeding starts hosing out. I'm surprised ARDS is such a small slice of that. Uh, yeah, to be honest with you, there's not my, I think it's late ARDS. Uh, you have pulmonary hypertension. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah. It's late ARDS. I mean, the problem is these diseases, the pulmonary hypertension is building up for the beginning a long, long time. Chronic. Long term, cr chronic, exactly. And some of them have very bad hearts. You know, and uh, so uh, you are going to have to list them for heart lung. Now, this is a big controversial statement I'm going to make. And I'm sure somebody from both hospitals is going to attack me on the way home. Um, I think everybody who has a high, uh, like a pulmonary hypertension needs to be listed for heart lung. There's questions that pulmonary hypertension gets better out of a lung transplant alone. But are you willing to take that risk if you're going for transplant? If you're going to go for transplant, I believe you're going to have to go for heart lung if you have bad pulmonary hypertension. I believe that. The right heart's going to be damaged. Exactly. I mean, COPD, I mean, everybody has that, like, you know, remember, sleep apnea gives you pulmonary hypertension. All these things, give, there's a lot of things that give you pulmonary hypertension. But again, which ones are really bad, irreversible, you know what I'm saying? That you're gonna crash from. Now here is like the different, the, the changes in group. Now I love, I gotta tell you, I love nitric oxides. I think, I the time to start nitric is when you think about it. Not to, not to bother it. So for me, when I start nitric in the OR, Patient goes to sleep, gets intubated, they get nitric out of the way, right away. And then run it straight through. Okay, and, uh, till you put, and if you have a problem, put the patient on ECMO. And now I'm gonna say this later when I put the cannulation and continue the nitric. Because you have to open the bridge between the right and the left, and you have to keep it open. And unless you can have a different cannulation strategy, that bridge has to stay open. Young Miller Known can maybe do a little pulmonary phase dilation, but there's a cost for Miller Known, which is, Systemic hypotension. And now, if you're gonna be going on ECMO and you're gonna add systemic hypotension uh, to your problem, you know, why not continue with nitric oxide again? You can use a process that'll make people happy. You're using down nitric. When I start nitric, I go to, for the gold, 40 parts per million. And you get, get things going. Once things are coming down, you can wean down. But I tell you, I mean, you need to go, if you're gonna open the bottle of nitric, go for the gold from the beginning. Because once you pop the bottle, the cost is right there. Fair enough. Yeah. So. Makes sense. Okay. Now, I'm keeping my comments to a minimum. <laughs> yes, please, because you know you're gonna get us all yelled at right now. And see, uh, this uh, how many of these patients? I mean, uh, they need visit pressers. I mean, I'll tell you, about hypertension patients when they crash, they need iotropes. They need they need pressers. I mean, it is a really bad crash. This is a, like basically mirror known, Voltaire, you know, something like that. They're the IV stuff. And, uh, you know, and the inhaled is the nitric oxide. So there's a limit to the, the IV stuff. It works, it causes systemic vasodilation. 
And I need to be honest with you, if I'm gonna put somebody on ECMO, I wanna minimize using other drugs. You already have mechanical support. Minimize using drugs to treat mechanical, I mean, might as well go for like for the gold. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little biased. And I do not get paid from the nitric oxide company, I promise you. Okay. But I feel the key to life is pulmonary vasodilation. Now here, we enter, we put the patient on ECMO, this would happen. And I Joe's cheating, because I called him yesterday about this. So Joe, what's your what's your thoughts here? Now you now you're again. So differential hypoxemia. Yes. You're talking about. So we put patient on ECMO, this would happen. Mm -hmm. And okay. this is for pulmonary hypertension? Yes. In that, uh, well, I mean. Well, what's, what's your thoughts? What, should, what do you think we should do? Well, if they have pulmonary hypertension, their LV is probably really not getting filled with much in the way of. Uh, Absolutely. Of, uh, deoxygenated blood. Because mm -hmm. their flow is not going to be there. Good. So, uh, you know, then we don't know if the lungs are working or not. Because it's just, a, it's a. It's now, a we're going to assume blood. they're very minimally working. Yeah. So, uh, in, in that particular case, um, I would probably advocate for cannulating the uh, right subclavian artery and going uh, VAA um, to make sure that I wasn't uh, having that differential de uh, hy uh, uh, hypoxemia or Harlequin syndrome, whatever you call it. Or I'd stick a line if I thought that the blood was getting through the lungs, but just uh, the lungs were not contributing, I'd put it in the right IJ and go, V-A-V. -A. This is more common than, than v -A -A. people think in general lines. It happens all the time. It will happen many times where you will find out that you actually cannulate the patient. The patient is on VA ECMO and you have an incredible PO2s and you are very excited and very happy. And the next thing that you know, the pupils are fixed and dilated and there are no And somebody draws a, 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 a PO2 from the right radial and it's 40. Yep. See, I've seen it, I can't tell you how many times. And then the, this is the name that, you know, you guys, I, I'm, you, know, you guys use the same name, Blue Man Syndrome? Yep. Yeah, I mean, for basically, you, you're half top, half is blue. And that's the importance, and I know we're here, everybody, everybody on the web, I'm sure is very well educated on that, right, radial A line is mandatory. This is what the experience is. You have no, you have gotten this situation, people call you up, oh, the PO2 is 400. Where did you draw it from? Up from the circuit, really? But the PO2 of the circuit is amazing, but that's not the patient's PO2. And that's, I think, where experience is. Absolutely. Experience is very important. Well, because if somebody calls you up and says, oh, you know, Joe, the PO2 is 400, we should see the ECMO. Where did you get that PO2 from? So I'll tell you, this is very important for us here, to, uh, like having experience. And this is just even where you're drawing your samples from, you know what I'm saying? Yes. You have so, to, yeah. The right, the right radial is probably the, it, well, it is the most accurate for determining what the brain is actually seeing. So Absolutely. You won't know necessarily the left carotid. The mixing cloud could be further, could be between the uh, the uh, right, the innominate and the uh, and the left carotid. We just don't know. Um, but uh, uh, but definitely it's probably what the coroners are seeing as well. Although the mixing cloud could be just above the coronary. So you're preserving the brain, but the deoxygenated blood is all the heart is seeing and it's never improving. So you really have to be able to think all the way down to just above that aortic valve. Well, uh, do you believe in cerebral oximetry? Yeah, well, cerebral oximetry? It is, it is a technology that might be promising. Um, I think that we need to learn a little bit more about it. And, um, uh, you know, the problem is still availability. You know, mm -hmm. we need to actually get the entire team comfortable with the readings and understand mm -hmm. what a false positive and a false negative is. Yes. I think that everybody is very comfortable looking at pulse ox when the pulse ox is 85 and you know that the patient is doing okay because everybody has a lot of experience with that. We need to have something similar. Yes. And I don't think cerebral oximetry is a bad thing, but I think you have to, like you just said, recognize its limitations. There was an excellent paper written at one point uh, called uh, Pumpkin or Patient. And it showed where if I were to hook a cerebral oximetry up to your brain, Dr. Samir, right now, it would give me a reading between this range. If we killed you, 
it could still give you a reading between that range. And if we killed you and removed your brain, you would still get a reading. So if you put it on a pumpkin with a candle in it, you get a reading. The problem is, can you truly believe it? And so just because you put it on and it's giving you a reading that you think is good does not absolutely mean it's good. And well, that's she, something that bothers me, it concerns me. Well, I'll tell you the problem is you cannot take a reading, you have to get a trend. Yes, that's true, that, but, that's your initial reading, the trend. but your initial reading has to be correct. So if you put it on, you have differential hypoxemia and don't know it, you put that on and it says that the re that, that it's giving you 62 on both sides, well, you're pretty excited and there, then you're gonna use that as your trend. But you have to look at the whole picture. So you're starting you're off with a bad number as a trend. If you're blue, uh, you're, if you have a blue uh, head syndrome and you are uh, 62, the, I mean, the, then I don't need a cerebral oximetry to tell me that. I can look at the patient and see you're talking about like you. a smurf. We're talking about uh, we have to have monitoring for the world out there. Yeah, I don't have a blue hue. I'm more yellow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to get that. Okay. Can we play that video, please? Uh, yeah. So we just look at cannulation video, and I'm going to talk about my little ideas about cannulation. And I, would I want to thank Tandem Live for uh, supplying that video. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, I mean, did you do any disclaimers? You did Tandem Life isn't, they just gave you the video out of the kindness of their heart. Right? No, but we don't. We they, have to they, say that, you know. Yeah, we, they, they are, I asked them for a good animation videos and they have an amazing video. Mm -hmm. Because I get, not everybody is like you and amazing at knowing how, what mm -hmm. animation is like. So anyways, this is our regular VA echocannulation in any like standard, femoral or any place. I now believe, uh, and uh, now Joe's gonna uh, get so excited, you might have to control him. Mm -hmm. He might need the ECMO right now, <laughs> yeah. okay? So yeah. I believe that dual cannulation on top and bottom. No ultrasound, first stick right in. Again, this is a video, it costs a lot of money to do the video, okay? So I told you, you're gonna have to control him. So I do believe cannulation from the neck, okay, also. And put the, uh, the, the neck, instead of uh, like not regular cannulation, put a protect dual, or something like a protect dual, which goes into the PA. And then you can cheat on that. So it's so like a little arvada, put an oxygenator. And that's so you're oxygenating and you try to overcome the pulmonary hypertension with a little nitric oxide. So that's a, like, you have a, a nice pump uh, facing against the wall, you know, pushing against the wall, with the, uh, pushing oxygenated blood, you know, putting the blood. Another idea which Joe likes, which I'm not sure I'm comfortable with, and not every cardiac surgeon is able to do. He works with amazing surgeons. I'm not sure every surgeon can do a septostomy successfully, which needs a lot of echo guidance where you're gonna do a septostomy. So any comments, uh, Joe? I, On you, septostomy? You're distracted with the video. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, no, I mean, I think, I think doing a transeptal uh, uh, puncture for decompressing. Can we go to the next video, please? Left side is a good, is, is a good, is a good technique. So that's your standard VA ECMO. Standard VA ECMO, exactly. Mm -hmm. I would have chosen the other side for the venous only because it's got to go up farther, but that's... See, I told, I told you you're going to have to restrain him. Mm -hmm. I told you you're going to have to restrain him. The other video? The other video, yes, please. We have to let the time that disclaimers go through and you know, we don't want to get in trouble. Is this a talking from the... Uh, I might from not the have to get my talk today. I'm going to run out of time. It's Dr. Severe. Like, mine's... Okay, okay, here, there. Now we're talking about... Okay, there's the heart stopped working. We gotta narrate this. <laughs> so I, I believe this could be a very good strategy for pulmonary hypertension patients. You know, and you you can get two in one, get a you know, an RVAT and an ECMO support at the same time. And when you want to start weaning, you can just put in a slice in and out the oxygenator. Mm -hmm. And it depends where you know what the strategy is for you in the institution. And I would be very honest here. Again, I might be, get beaten up outside. If your ECMO numbers are down or up, once you put the oxygenator, it becomes the ECMO, you take the oxygenator, it's an MCS. And so really, I mean, it's a strategy a lot of institutions use. Because really, it's just, you don't have to do anything with the cannulation. It's just the oxygenator in and out. Uh, so, uh, well, we, don't, we just don't have to run the whole video, let's just get the neck part. So would you yeah. do a would you do a protec and, and as a plastic? That's or, a little too much. Um, 
I, I I'm mean, just putting, I, I'm no, just putting on the spot. I'm just putting on the spot. I know. No, I don't think so. I don't. I don't believe so. Okay. Um, I don't know that I would do a Protect Duo for uh, for pulmonary hypertension. I can de I can decompress the right side. But usually, um, the right the right sides of those patients are failing. The right sides are failing. They're dilated and totally failing. But it doesn't matter because I'm going to be decompressing it with just VA ECMO. I mean, I'm going to be but, treating but you're the right trying, side. But, but we're trying to get a look at the future. Mm -hmm. We want to put something with the future in mind yeah. that you know we can start. Patient can be the Go come ahead off. And speed this up a little bit. We don't need to yeah. watch the come off ECMO. Fancy stuff. Absolutely, forward, come off ECMO and go to the right, right, right side support only. Go a little. Okay, so there. That goes there. Okay. So now this is uh, this is the Protect Duo you're saying? No, no, this is uh, no or standard protect. venous. No, we can go up a little more till we go to the neck. Um, okay, that just looked like standard. The standard venous. venous. Yeah, I think. Yeah, okay. I can. Now this is. Uh, this yeah, just actually uh, accelerated till you go to the neck. <laughs> And of course, and I'm not, you know, while this is playing and they're doing all of this stuff. So it's you, a, uh, it's a concentric line there. Eh? You have to remember that yes. the, the problem with that oxygenator on the Tandem Life is that it has no heat exchanger. It was designed as a CO2 removal device and it, uh, horsepower is inefficient for the size patients that we get and their metabolic uh, demands. We can't oxygenate. Uh, you, you can't take somebody with a, uh, a venous saturation of 50 or 45 and get them, get their arterial sats up high enough because there's just not enough horsepower. Great for CO2 removal, not very good for oxygenation. So anyway, the can goes into the PA again, so we really can push. But again, you still have to open the bridge and that's why I feel there's a, a nitric oxide, you know, uh, you know, like, like a swamp pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're just oxygenating and, and uh, dumping the blood over there and, and really, I mean, I think the only reason I like this strategy is for one reason. You can win really actual central ECMO and have our vital law and then think of progressing from there. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's a good tool for right heart failure. Absolutely. Well, I think it's also a good tool for just standard VV ECMO, although I think there are other ways to do that. Um, but those patients with the crash, as I told you, RVs dilated and failing. Yes, but that could be secondary to left heart failure. First. No, it's secondary to lung. Uh, lung if it's lung. pulmonary hypertension, then of course that's just due yeah, to that. Yeah. I agree with you there. But again, the key is to decompress it. Once you've relieved the pressure, that goes away. Um, and now you're, so this is going to be drawing both. It's a, it's a dual lumen catheter. So you're yeah. draining from the right atrium, exactly. returning to the pulmonary artery under pressure. And that's what I feel like, you know, you're getting in one compact thing, one step, two things which are important. Yeah, I don't think it's a bad tool. I just yeah. think that it's not a panacea like anything. And uh, no, no, there's nothing. I mean, I, you have to look what's good for the, for the patient. And I feel it's good for hypertension because now they're young. You can get them walking with that at some point that you hope. Yes. You know, that they can yes. be, you can just like you know, the Av back in the Avalon days, you know what I'm saying? Yes. You can get them walking. We're walking with that, and I feel it's you're starting to rehabilitate them. Yes. And, and those patients, because if you're going to listen for lung transplant, they have to be able to walk. Yes, but you know, and, and, and I know I'm going to get yelled at, but that's fine by, by those guys over there because I'm delaying things. But look, you, you can't, you have to make sure that you are making clear to people out there, our audience, you're talking about patients with a chronic illness that you're going to be. Uh, exercising so that they remain conditioned for a transplant operation. If you're talking about a patient who is coming in with a, an acute disease or post cardiotomy that we couldn't wean off bypass that took a right heart hit, or they have severe ARDS and developed pulmonary hypertension also and start having right heart failure, those patients are not going to be getting up and walking. These people are really, really, really sick. So it's a completely, these are two totally different patient populations that we're talking about. And I need to make sure the audience recognizes that you're not advocating this in the acute illness patient who is septic. They're not going to be getting up walking around with ECMO. Just the pulmonary hypertension, young population that forgive me, I'm ready for lung transplants. Agreed.
In that case, I think it's a great device. And here's the numbers prove what I'm saying. I try not to make up stuff. I try not to. So here's survival from uh, ECLS to decannulation. You can look at the numbers and the odds ratio. I mean, the, the, I mean, ECLS was very important. Early implementation of ECLS was early was very important. Agreed. It's a young population that when you list them, they'll get along. Well, the military they, knows they, that. Yeah, the golden yeah. hour. You yes. get the soldier from the battlefield exactly. and his major injury to the to the hospital, their chances of survival are increased by incredible amounts. The, the, the LAS scores will be high. You're going to be able to uh, list them and get along for them. Right. Time to balloon for the calf class. Exactly. Time is muscle. We, I mean, these are all concepts I think all of us So that's, that's really my point is easy. I last them very early. Don't, don't ponder too much. No journal clubs. And a, lot, a lot of people are going to kill me on the way out. I, I get that, you know. No, we're the, not. The no, 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 not you. The, no. other, the, other two, the other two systems. No, we're going to have your back because oh, the, the question <laughs> thing is, it's, I think everybody agrees, put them on. That's the easy part where we keep having the discussion, not in these patients, obviously, but in the acute situation is making the decision that, OK, we put them on. We've had an opportunity now to evaluate this. Yes, we should continue. No, we should not continue. There is the that is the that is the holy grail of decisions right there. And if you look at in hospital mortality compared to regular ECMO patients, to compared to post cardiomy ECMO, they actually do better than post cardiomy. The reason is because there's a younger population. Mm -hmm. Most of them are a younger population, and their heart has not beaten up for a long bypass run. So I mean, you I mean, does that, that, that the same comparison now really? But I'm trying to encourage ECLS is not a bad thing. It's not the bypass run. It's inadequate myocardial preservation. Don't blame the pump. <laughs> so, but I'll tell you, ECLS does save. Do I want to put the brain on ECMO? No, but I do believe in ECLS. He keeps asking me questions. 